Well, good morning, Rolling Roads Baptist Church. Glad you are all out today on this bright and sunny morning uh, to worship the Lord. It is still morning. And um, Bob Young will not be here today. As you know, he's very busy in the hospital recovering, and I hear he's doing really well. Uh, on the announcements, the um, library is open. Uh, I understand there are new acquisitions being had as we speak, and so be sure to be involved in your library uh, and sharing what's happening also. Did we have a, a zip this week? It was like nothing, and then you sent the one. Was it this week? It said, is anything happening out there? Yeah, okay, this yeah. week, yeah. Don't have anything happening out there yet. No, nothing's happening out there. So be sure to let us know that. And continue in prayer. And are there any other announcements? All right. Well, let's, uh, I want to encourage you then to enjoy your worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you. 
don't you try that this morning? See if you can get both hands to work like that and make a heart. Even it's a square heart. <laughs> That's hard. Yeah, see if you can share a heart with your, uh, with your neighbors. Uh. <laughs>
Uh, this was meant to be the last sermon in January, uh, but since we had a strange weather incident, we are hearing from Zechariah here in February. So um, rest assured that uh, next week's sermon will not come from the minor prophets, but this will be our final one. And we're hearing from the second Z in the list, Zechariah. So turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 10. And we will hear through Zechariah the voice of God. And he is uh, that priestly prophet who served during the rebuilding of the temple after the exile. This prophecy is against the house of Judah, or to the house of Judah, the flock of the Lord of hosts. And this passage here that we'll read in chapter 10 is about transformation, about how God takes a scattered and defeated people and forms a nation for himself. So it's about hope, but it is against false hope, and it is about success and victory and family prosperity, but it is not false victory or false prosperity. And it is a godly thing for people, for families, and for nations to be strong and mighty in the Lord. It is a good thing, a godly thing, and it is a correct and right thing. And it should be embraced by all sane, reasonable people that people... Families and nations can be strong and mighty in the Lord. This is a positive and good thing. That is, to be strengthened and not weak. To be powerful and not defeated. And all of this uh, shouldn't be because of false religion or worldly power, but because of God himself. All these things are good and right and should happen because of God himself. That is, the spiritual power of God makes strong and mighty people, families, and nations. Let me repeat. It is the spiritual power of God that makes strong and mighty people, strong and mighty families, and strong and mighty nations. So as God provides and God acts, God proves the power of his covenant with his people. And it is a power of joy. Today I heard, uh, I shouldn't have said it because I don't have all the information, but I heard, I believe, a Bach, part of a Bach piece that was titled, uh, had a neat title in German, I can't say it anymore like I could a few minutes ago, but in English, it was something like uh, joy in the new covenant. Joy in the new covenant. And it was a festive, exciting piece. So as we look at this, we look at this chapter 10, all along the way, we see at least three backdrops for Jesus' ministry. Asking God for what is good, the shepherding of the flock of God, and the calming of of the seas. So, verse 1 of chapter 10. Let's see, how did I want to read these? I think I'm going to read them as I have them marked in this Bible, and then we will follow along. So, I'll read the first section, and then we'll pray together. Ask rain from the Lord at the time of the spring rain, the Lord who makes the storm clouds. And he will give them showers of rain, vegetation in the field to each man. For the teraphims speak iniquity, and the diviners see lying visions, and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would help us to see your words across the ages today 
and help us to apply these to our lives for your glory and for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So he begins by saying, Ask God for rain so you can have vegetation. Each field, every man has enough. And he says, Ask. Because God's the one that makes the storm clouds. And, you know, and it's funny how he's saying, Ask for rain at the time of the spring rain. Why is he saying that? He's saying it because he wants us to see that if we ask, God will give and that God is able to do uh, these things and people will have enough. And then in verse 2, this is somehow in contrast to the lying, deceiving fortune tellers. Uh, iniquity and lying visions there in verse 2 are what they offer to the people in response to the people's natural desire to want to know the future. You know, we all want to know who, what's going to happen next. And, you know, we want to know how it's going to come out. We want to know what's going to happen. And yet these people are lying to the people, telling false dreams and deceiving them. And the teraphim, uh, long story short, apparently refer to earthly demons and their handlers, the diviners, people who sort of work for these earthly demons. And they tell fake dreams of comfort that will not happen. The old uh, commentator, Matthew Henry, reading these verses, he said, they were all a cheat and a sham. They were all a cheat and a sham. And you can think of probably many ways that this will apply in our world today. The teraphim speak iniquity, the diviners see lying visions and tell false dreams, they comfort in vain. And so, uh, there is no shepherd as the result. There's no spiritual leadership. Uh, there's no uh, godly people who are pointing them in the right direction. No one to keep them together or to help them. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 you will recall that Jesus seeing the people he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And in these verses, we see that they wander off there in verse 2, wandering around. Well, people do want comfort and assurance, don't they? We all need a safe space, but we don't appreciate false ones, places that say they're safe places, but they're actually a trap. Um, something funny happened at a fire department where um, Alex was, or someplace where Alex was at some point, and he asked a question of something and, the, and uh, maybe uh, the lady inside said, well, the sign on the outside says it's a safe space. You know, something like that. So we all want those, right? We want to hear everything's going to be fine if you do such and such and so and so. And sometimes what is being said is obviously false, such as the individual who is still on television, uh, Bishop Apostle so-and-so from such and such Louisiana, who is still on there talking about how if you'll send him uh, $75 and return his prayer cloth for something that you will be rich and wealthy. And there are still thousands of people who apparently believe it. Uh, obviously false teaching silly, uh, you know, and the world is full of careless leaders who will default to whatever is popular among their depraved peers because they want to look good to their friends. And most of church leadership is about the latest books, tapes, seminars, and rallies. And, you know, yuck. Uh, so what is it that makes people like sheep? What is it? It's, it's the idea that we like to cooperate and we like to have faith in leaders, right? If you just look at the comment section of some, you know, no, not any detail, but comment sections are generally negative. And I have seen through the years uh, people refer to like sheep and it being a cut down and it being a, a way of, of 
digging on people and saying a bad thing about them. But what is it that, that makes us com compared to sheep? Because it's all through the scripture. What is it that makes us, what, are, what is the similarity that they're drawing? It's not a negative thing. It's that we like to cooperate with one another. We like to have faith in leaders. We do believe that there's safety in numbers because there it is. You know, and we do these things. This is how we are. And so sometimes, however, faith in leaders is misplaced for sure. The question is always, ultimately, will we trust in people or in God himself? And, you know, it's not really a, shouldn't be a one-to-one, -one, shouldn't be a, a choice, one or the other, people or God. You know, there should be godly people. That's what he's talking about here. There is no shepherd in verse 2. There should be people that are trustworthy that can be followed without a problem. Look, there's a sheep. And there's some sheep and a shepherd. Will we trust in people? He tells us to ask. God tells us to ask. And Jesus also said very clearly, did he not ask? Remember? Seek and knock. He said the same thing. Ask and seek and knock. And he will respond to us. And he is good. He is true. He can be trusted to do the right things. If we are rightly led by the good shepherd... Jesus Christ himself, who has proven himself to be the savior of humanity, then we can do no better. There isn't anybody any better. It's just like the disciples said, to whom shall we go? Where will we run? This church needs to trust in the good shepherd himself and not anybody else. There's no pope coming, you know? We have to trust in the good shepherd himself and not false leaders who make false, vague promises that sound good, that cannot be defined. You know? So will we be rightly led? Will we not wander away? We will not wander away. We will listen for God's promises and God's voice. And we will not be led astray because of carelessness or apathy. So the question is always, will we ask? Will we seek? Will we knock? As Jesus told us, you know, if we have a problem, my message is, God is our solution. I'm the pastor, right? If we have a problem, God is our solution. Now don't make fun of me. Well, preacher, if the roof's leaking, that don't mean God's a solution. But, you know, ultimately, God enables us, right, to have the resources to repair a leaking roof. The roof is not leaking, as far as we know, any more than usual. Right, Craig? <laughs> so if we have a problem, God is our solution. The solution is never the vain strategies and ploys of greedy, false shepherds. Don't ever fall for it. So verse 3 and verse 4, I'll read my anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the male goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic horse in battle. From them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg, from them the bow of battle, from them every ruler, all of them together. Wow. So here we have a shocking turn of events, God is angry with the false shepherds who do this false leading, who have drawn the people astray. God visits to punish those who are not faithful shepherds, but are really male goats. It's a fun little play on words there. And you'll remember the sheep and the goats from Jesus' teaching as well. The Lord of hosts will transform his flock into something more like his majestic horse in battle. So if you look back at this picture, that doesn't remind you of a majestic horse in battle, does it? But that's what God said he's going to transform into his majestic horse in battle. And this means that some results are going to happen from them in verse 4. All these amazing positive things which are somewhat miraculous. The cornerstone comes. The cornerstone. 
just out there, just says the cornerstone. Now, in context, this might refer to the temple, rebuilding of the temple, the cornerstone of worship, the cornerstone of God's house, or the tent peg coming. That could be uh, indicative of all sorts of powerful things which anchors the tent down in a battle campaign or sets the territory limit in the battle campaign or in the new uh, conquest of a land where your tents are moved further out. And then the bow of battle, you know what that is. That's the, the literal bow, which is the most fearsome weapon of the day. And every ruler, all of them together, comes from Judah. So this is a sort of a picture of all of these leaders. In contrast to the false leaders, all of these rulers and leaders come from Judah in a militaristic kind of way, but apparently also in a spiritual way, and apparently in mostly a spiritual way. So it's an amazing turn of events here. From them, the sheep that have been wandering off, by the time verse 4 comes, they are a well-regulated, mighty, prosperous, and blessed people of God. So how do we apply this to our lives? Well, God's plans are far better than the baloney puddled, peddled by charlatans and pretenders. Uh, I've, there I've used the word baloney again in the sermon. I've tried to limit this in my ministry, but it just keeps coming up over and over. God's plans are far better than the other stuff. I believe that God will punish those who mislead and who deceive Christian people. And so who knows what great things God can do with the people who are under his true leadership. Who knows what God can do? If we listen to bad advice, we will have bad results. If we hear the voice of the covenant Lord, the one who gives us joy because of the new covenant, Jesus, the head of the church and Lord of our lives, then amazing and unexpected things can happen. When we've looked back on them, when they're happening, we may not even be aware of them. Remember Flickering Lamps, that little book. Remember the stories there. Remember the, the principles that were in there and the steadfast reliance on God alone. When the church people seek the Lord and then the doors of ministry open to them in ways that they can't imagine or they can Think of totally unexpected things can happen and do happen and continue to happen today. Verse 5 and 6. Oh, let me just check before I do something wrong. Yep. Verse 5 and 6. They will be as mighty men, treading down the enemy in the mire of the streets in battle. And they will fight, for the Lord will be with them. And the riders on horses will be put to shame. I will strengthen the house of Judah. And I will save the house of Joseph. And I will bring them back. Because I have had compassion on them. And they will be as though I had not rejected them. For I am the Lord their God. And I will answer them. So we see that as a result of this reversal... The wandering sheep are completely transformed into a victorious and amazing military force. That's his image here that he's using. They'll be like mighty men. They'll be fighting and God will fight with them. And cavalry will be the, the cavalry. Cavalry. The cavalry, of course, will be embarrassingly defeated by them. Let's see. Riders on horses will be put to shame. Will be defeated by the infantry. So this is a, a big reversal here. The infantry, like mighty men, treading down in the streets, they will fight, and the cavalry, did I say that right? Cavalry. Cavalry. Cavalry, cavalry thank you. <laughs> will be put to shame. Okay? 
preachers can't say two, both of those words. We can only say one. So that's what he's talking about. It is, you know, of course, very unusual for cavalry to be defeated, or horsemen, but even horsemen, to be defeated by infantry, right? So that would be totally backwards from what you would expect. And so, God is transforming them. And um, by transforming them, what he's doing here is salvation, strengthening salvation, bringing them back. And so, he's doing this for a reason. And I want us to not make sure, I want us to make sure that we don't miss the reason there in verse 6. The reason he's doing all this. And there's the word in English, because. So what is his reason? And in some ways this could lead us into February, the month of love and compassion, because it is because of his compassion that he has for the house of Judah. His previous rejection of them will be undone. And why? Why? What motivates God to do all of this for them? And notice he, he's, these are his people, the house of Judah. And then don't skip over you know, what we've been talking about in our Bible study podcasts. The house of Joseph, he says here. Actually, the house of Joseph is, is considered to be this, you know, this southern kingdom too. And he's doing all of this because he has a covenant with them. He is their Lord. And he will answer them according to his covenant. And that's the language there at the end of verse 6. I've had compassion on them, and they will be as though I had not rejected them. And then the final reason, for I am the Lord their God. And I will answer them. How do you like that? No matter what. That's his covenant. So he has a definite relationship with these people. And Zechariah wants them to remember this intimately. That he ultimately will redeem them from any troubles. So do you hope for the compassion of the Lord? Woo, I was supposed to show that, wasn't I? A while back. So that's for verses 5 and 6. God transforms those wandering sheep. But as we apply it to our lives, are we looking for the compassion of the Lord? Are we looking for the covenant of the Lord? His loving kindness or His covenant love that we see all through the Scriptures and running clean in through the New Testament? Do we see this as being vivid in our life? Now, we're not expecting, at least hopefully most people, are not expecting a military thing like in Zechariah's day, but we see these images can make sense to us even today. We see a great victory over sin. And in the Bible, we learn of sin's defeat. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We have been brought back by Christ, and everything has been made new again in the new covenant. We are brought out of captivity to sin, out of bondage to the failure of humanity. Can I say that again? Out of bondage to to the perpetual, hapless, continued failure of humanity and into the promise of Jesus' love, the love of God, the covenant love of God. This is God's power. This is His victory that flows through His people, that flows from our trust in His compassion and His loving kindness. So verse 7 8, 9, 10, 11. Ephraim will be like a mighty man, and their heart will be as glad as if from wine. Indeed, their children will see it and be glad. Their heart will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will whistle for them to gather them together, for I have redeemed them. And they will be as numerous as they were before. When I scattered them among the peoples, they will remember me in far countries. And they with their children will live and come back. I will bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no room can be found for them. And they will pass through the sea of distress. And he will strike the waves in the sea so that all the depths of the Nile will dry up and the pride of Assyria will be brought down and the scepter of Egypt will depart. So verse 7, he sort of is starting over again almost and he's reminding us of what his redemption of his people is going to be like. And Ephraim will be like a mighty man. He will be truly happy inside and, and carefree. And their kids will be happy because the parents are carefree as well. And so the worry is less. Verse 8, you love this verse. God will whistle for them. Sort of like calling the children back to the house for dinner. If you remember those days of the old thing we called the neighborhood. Or like a shepherd calling the flock to gather them up perhaps. The whistle and the sheep go, whoa. And they look up to see where they are. And they come back to the shepherd. He has redeemed them and they are numerous. Their numbers have been reduced. But now they're bouncing back. Children and family together are happy in the Lord. In verse 9, the scattering of the people will cause more glory for the Lord. And people will return from all over. More children have been born into God's people. In verse 10, they have been or they will be in a whole lot of places, Egypt and Assyria, coming home to Gilead and Lebanon. And the land is filled up with numerous families of God's people that he has brought back from the scattering. And verse 11 talks about how they're overcoming dangers and troubles on their way home. Waters such as the Nile or the, the dangerous seas. Maybe even the Red Sea is in mind here. You strike the waves upon the sea and the depths of the Nile will dry up. Assyria and Egypt seem to be both powerless and defeated as the scattered people come home and the border disappears. And Jesus is calming the sea, crossing the Red Sea and the Jordan River. All of these images come to our mind here. And so to apply this to our life, it isn't very funny to be far from God. It isn't funny at all to be spiritually dead or hollow inside, to feel no fellowship with our Creator. Uh, we can cover this up. We can cover it up well with our daily living, with our trivial pursuits, which used to be a board game, and our mind-numbing choices that some people will get into and become addicted to. We can avoid and we can avoid and we can avoid, but guess what? The truth is, is still there. The void is still there. No matter how flung we are, God can still bring us back to Himself. No matter how down in the depths of grief we may be, no matter how depressed we may feel, no matter how hopeless we may feel, God can bring us back for Himself. In fact, I believe that God is whistling for us. Oops, I was supposed to show another slide, I believe. Yeah, there's God calling his people back. Something's wrong with this preacher's notes. So I've <laughs> got to do something better next week. That they return to glorify him, right? As we said. But I believe that God is whistling for us today. I believe that God is continuing to whistle for us as he calls us home today. He promises us the carefree rejoicing of a child who is secure in the love of her heavenly Father. That's what God wants for each of us. And you are not alone. You are not alone. There are very many, many people striving to hear His voice today. To hear the voice of God today through His Word. To follow His Word today. So you're not alone. And God is calling you home no matter where you are. As the song says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already.
already come. It is grace that has brought us safe this far. And grace will lead us home. Verse 12, Zechariah concludes, at least somebody concluded chapter 10 this way. And Zechariah says, I will strengthen them in the Lord and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. God says he will strengthen them. And in the Lord, I believe, is a glimpse there of the Holy Trinity of God. In his name, they are going to walk or live into the future. And this has been declared or decreed by God himself. And so we see how much the prophecy covers. It is about the future. It is as much about the future as it is about the hearts of those who hear it. The hearts of those who hear this prophecy. Will the people trust Zechariah's word to them from the Lord? And so we have a choice as well. We have a choice as well to believe the true word of God or follow along with the popular, in the bag deal with major players, success, Hollywood, Madison Avenue, civil, religion, Christian, whatever it is, evangelainment. There is plenty of spiritual entertainment or feel good religion out there. But God has great plans if his people will ask him. If we will leave off, you know, the phony baloney, there it is again. If we'll leave off of that, why should we settle for the drudgery of captivity in a spiritual wasteland? Why should we do that? Why should we settle for this? Let the loud mouths fail and let God's people suddenly reveal the land flowing with milk and honey in the new covenant of God. Follow the Lord for yourself. Lift up your family. Encourage your friends. Ask, seek, and knock just as Jesus taught us. Trust in the Lord only, for He will make us mighty. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that True success is faithfulness to you and that there is no unproductive worship or ministry. There is only true ministry and false ministry. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, for your grace, for your blessing upon us, for the inspiration that we take from this true prophet, Zechariah. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us mighty. And Lord, though there are many of us who are down and are recovering and busy and dealing with difficulties, yet Lord, we know your promises and your loving kindness is ever with us. In Jesus' name, we rejoice today. Amen. Stand as we sing our closing song. We'll sing the first verse of Be Strong in the Lord. Jesus, the risen Son of God, who speaks the truth. Amen. And go in peace.